Good Monday morning, everyone. Wisconsin's 29th Assembly District candidate, Neil Klein, is my very special guest today, Monday, April 27th, 2020. I'm Ben Dryden. You're watching Dryden Wire Live. Got a lot of good guests lined up for this week. Probably not going to announce them all right away because we might still be moving some of them around. Tomorrow, though, we know for sure, Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald will be on. And if you didn't see it last Friday, go to DrydenWire.com to get more information. He and I will be doing a drawing during tomorrow's show to help raise money for Embrace, a nonprofit organization that we both hugely support, as well as another small business during the drawing of the live show. So you don't want to miss that. We'll have more information on our website again later today. But there is a lot right now on DrydenWire.com. Going to be a great show. Can't wait. But today, we are chatting with Wisconsin's 29th Assembly District candidate, Neil Klein. Let's see if we can get him on. There he is. Neil, good morning, man. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. It's raining up here. How about you? Yeah, yeah. We've got some rain coming down. But I I can get on board with with the rain, even though it is a bummer, because I think today we might break 70. And uh, of all the days to break 70 and then have rain, that's kind of a bummer. I didn't know we were going to get that. I Honestly, I don't even look at the weather anymore. It's, I mean, <laughs> unless it's going to be, you know, a foot of snow, uh, I'm just assuming it's going to be April weather or a little bit of rain yeah. and maybe a little nice day, but does it sure. doesn't really impact my day at all. Yeah. Well, I try to keep an eye on it because I, I enjoy to get, trying to get the motorcycle out of the garage. So oh, you I, have a motorcycle. I to, yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, it's it's fun. I Occasionally, I get yelled at by my by uh, my grandparents and things for uh, owning one, but I have a really good time with it. So if it's raining, not really the best time to to take her out. Yeah, you should sell that. Yeah, no kidding. Hmm. I should sell the bike. <laughs> you really should. Here, here here's a, a, a morose Monday comment. Uh, a <laughs> good friend of mine just died on a motorcycle. Wasn't doing anything wrong. Oh no! Even had a helmet on. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Get rid of the motorcycle. We want we want to keep you around for a while. Well, I uh, I appreciate that that warning, and we'll certainly work to be very careful. Yeah, I'm sure I'll get a whole bunch of hate mail from people now, but that's all right. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to keep you alive, man. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. So for people who don't know you, it's the first time on the show. Again, thank you very much for coming yeah. on. You're, so you're running in the 29th Assembly District. But before we get into all that stuff, uh, safer at home, I mean, man, there's so much to get to today. But for those who don't know you very well, tell us a little a little bit about you. Sure. Well, I am. Um, I'm from, actually I'm from Polk County originally. So I went to uh, high school at Unity in Balsam Lake, and uh, uh, now I currently live in New Richmond. Um, but kind of the path from there to here uh, took me through UW Madison. So I went to UW Madison for school um, before moving back up here to be be closer to family and. Um, Got a job in the cities and have been enjoying kind of being closer to home and closer to family after after being at school in Madison. But um, that's kind of a a quick recap of where I've lived and and uh, things like that. But it's uh well uh, hold on a second on. here. So I, I saw on um on January twenty first. So you had sent it to Dryden White. We published it. A, yeah. That you had announced your candidacy. And in here it says where is it? Well, new opportunity. Um, you worked for State Senator Sheila Harsdorf at some point. What was that about? What did you do there? Well, I worked for her for a number of years. I uh, First, I worked on her re-election campaign in 2016. Uh-huh. And then I worked for her in the State Senate after she'd won re-election. Uh, and then I worked for her at the Department of Agriculture so uh, was, while she was so, secretary. So, so when you say work for her, what do you, what do you, what do, you do? Um, I did a kind of a wide range of stuff. So in her, um, I mean, for her Senate campaign, it was a lot of, you know, getting the yard science and finding volunteers and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, and then in the state Senate, there was a lot of, you know, kind of constituent work, but also a lot of, um, a lot of learning for me about the way that, um, the legislature, uh, operates and in, in, in the Senate for sure. Um, and a lot about the issues Sheila focused on. She was on the universities and technical colleges committee. Um, she was the chair. And so there was a lot of um, opportunity to learn from uh, her time doing doing things there. And then at the Department of Agriculture, I worked in kind of in our communication shop uh, with, uh, with folks. There was a, a woman who uh, went on maternity leave, so I was filling in there for a little bit. And then the, the main thing that I did at the Department of Agriculture was work on the dairy task force. 
she and Governor Walker started the Wisconsin Dairy Task Force to um, focus on, obviously, we're the dairy state, to focus on dairy issues and to try and find ways to make it um, so that the dairy industry can be uh, successful and viable over the long term. Mm-hmm. So that was that took up a lot of my time at, at uh, DATCAP, as, as it's called down there. Uh, what did you learn from doing that o- outside of just the getting to know how the inner workings happen and how you file of this or how this and there's a press release about this o- outside of that? What did you just learn from doing that? Sure. Well, I, I think that Sheila and one of the things that I really appreciated about Sheila was her style. Um, she was really someone who would tell you what she thought and she would listen um, really carefully to folks. And I think that. Um, one of the things that I really came to appreciate working for her and, and came to appreciate and, and try to kind of bring out in myself while, while running for this is, uh, someone who's an empathetic listener and also a fighter. And I think that that's a combination that we really need in a representative in Madison. And I think that, um, you know, I really valued that opportunity to learn from Sheila, um, those, those kinds of traits and Mm. to try and and make sure that I can, um, you know, continue that that kind of style of politics. I think it's a good way to operate. See, it's interesting you brought that up. I was just having a conversation with my wife this weekend. Uh, we were kind of going back through a whole bunch of shows that we have done, or that I've done, and we, she mm. was listening to some because she didn't get a chance to hear some of them. And it's interesting to see the the dynamics and the and the personalities of people that are running for office. Mm. And she was one who actually kind of noticed that there are some that – Boy, they're gonna they're gonna tell you what they think. They're gonna they're gonna speak their mind, and if you like it, great. And and if you don't, that's okay. But you're gonna know exactly where I stand and why. And then there's others that are everything is just down the middle. Well, I could see both sides all the time, and I don't really have a strong opinion either side. We just need to work together, and there's that's totally legitimate, right? There's no no right or wrong here, and some of it could be politics, some of it could just be that's just their personality. Again, that's yeah. fine. Um, but you had just said that Sheila was kind of the, the, the more of a, I'm going to kind of speak my mind. Uh, and I think sometimes maybe that's, I wouldn't say dangerous, but it's not like just a free card to, to, to say whatever you want about anything you want. Where do you fall in as a candidate? Which one would you subscribe to more? Well, I, this, you might kind of think that this is a little bit of a ridiculous answer, but I, I think that you have to be both. I think if you want to be a successful um, well, it's not even successful, actually. If you want to be the kind of politician or the kind of representative, importantly, that is in a that has the capacity to lead, you both have to simultaneously be able to articulate what you think and defend what you think and justify what you think and what you say. But you also, I don't think, um, can freely shut out um, either dissenting opinions or opinions that you don't like. And I think that I, I view listening, it's it's not some mushy, feel-good thing. Like, I'm not listening because I want to make people necessarily feel good, and, and it, it's not really about that for me. I really value listening because the point of it is to learn something. And when you learn something, I think that's when you can really kind of um, – power up your own thoughts on an issue because you can either go, huh, I hadn't thought about that before. And now that I heard it, now I can take it into account. And now my own thinking about an issue has been improved. Or you can hear something and go, I, I hear what you're saying, but I disagree for reasons X, Y, and Z. And it doesn't, you know, now, now we can kind of move on. So it's, it's important, of course, to make sure that people feel they're listened to, and I think that that's a really important job of a campaign yeah. and of representing people. Um, but it's also because it's important to make sure that that you're getting a lot of information and you're thinking about things in a way where you can become better um, better at articulating what you think and you can better defend what you think. Well, uh, that uh, if, if I ever had any lingering questions about ever running for an office, you, you, you just... You have now just solidified uh, the fact that I will never, because uh, <laughs> I usually don't. It's I'm right, you're wrong, and uh, pound sand. <laughs> but that's yeah. why I'm not running for office. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that sometimes, um, sometimes of course, you're, you'll disagree, and you got to tell people when you disagree. But um, I, I, I believe that 
listening will generally be helpful. And even if in the end you don't agree with the person, at least you heard them out yeah. and you've got a better idea yeah. about what you think. So before we get into the issues and your opinions on what's happening to Safer at Home, yeah, let's skip forward, uh, we'll just assume six months or two years. Yeah. And this has been, I wouldn't say resolved, but, but we're back now to a normal. It'll be a new normal, but back to a normal. Mm-hmm. What issues do you think would be facing your, well, in this case, 29th Assembly District, what issues are you looking at as we really need to be focusing on these? So again, we're, we're going to remove the safer at home thing. What mm-hmm. issues do you think are pressing in the 29th Assembly District? Well, I think that, I mean, apart from all of the, obviously the, the really short term, um, or I won't say short term, immediate issues of, of small businesses that are struggling to make it through and farmers that are struggling to market their products and all of those really kind of acute problems um, that are that are real and that we need to be seriously talking about. I think that when you when I think about the long term impacts of everything that's that's happened so far, um, we have really, I think, taken a kind of a baseball bat to the long term wealth of a lot of people. And it's about impacting the value of businesses over the long term and retirement accounts over the long term and the the financial health and well-being Mm -hmm. of residents in the 29th and across the state and across the country. Mm -hmm. Um, It's going to take a long time to repair that financial damage. So so actually, maybe maybe we should talk about all this instead of trying to skip past all that. Maybe this all does kind of get tied in. So mm-hmm. l- let's actually talk about that before we get to it. So I'm sorry to kind of just, no. <laughs> it's, it's live. So what are you going to do? Yeah. Um, <laughs> mm. Show biz. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so so what are your thoughts about this? It seems like that's kind of where we're going right now. So let's get into that right now. The Safer at Home order that Evers first put out, I don't know what it is now. I, I'd have to look, a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, what were your thoughts on that? Well, I was disappointed, I think, in the way that the governor communicated his decision. Um, I think that when the first order was put out, we really did not know as much as we know now about the virus and about how it would proceed in the state. And um, I, I think that that um, the while the order, I think you could probably have a, a reasonable debate about um the order, especially when it comes to talking about how to move forward, I think at the time it came as a huge surprise, particularly because there had been multiple times where the governor had said that we wouldn't need one. And that kind of confusion and um, quick, you know, snap decision making, I think really unsettled people. It unsettled me and it, it led to a lot of um, confusion. And so from a communications perspective, perspective, I, I think that that was kind of a, a failing. And then I think that that was compounded with the extension, where we really didn't get any kind of good public discourse about what is the right way to proceed. Mm-hmm. And and I think that, that that, to me, is the really frustrating part, um, apart, of course, from the impacts that are, that are happening to folks and to their lives. I think that that's a place where um, where I really struggled with the governor's response at the beginning and, and kind of throughout this whole thing. What, what grade would you give Evers? If there's two grades, the first one of the, the initial order and then the second one of the extension. Well, I think I think on the initial order, um, I would probably have to give him a D or an F, uh, largely stemming from a communications perspective that that he just he did not lead us in the way that I wish he had. And I think that it really damaged our uh, our capacity to 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 follow his leadership then on the second one. And when you haven't done a good job of communicating, then on the second one, I mean, I'm giving you an F because you didn't communicate with the state about what you wanted to do. And more importantly, you didn't talk to the state about how the state felt it should proceed. And I think on the first one, I can understand that. Um, you know, we had this emergency and we needed to respond in some way. But by the time you're issuing an extension, it's time to start talking to a wider circle of yeah. people. And it's yeah. time to start having those conversations about how to proceed. And And I think it was clear after that first issue, after the first order had been issued, that the public wanted to talk about this. 
And we needed to have that conversation. So then to not have it um, is really, yeah. you know, disappointing is a word that gets thrown around a lot. But it, it is. It's really disappointing mm-hmm. that he didn't have that conversation. Uh, that conversation, a lot of people have talked about. We've had M. Jarko on, and he, former representative, and mm-hmm. he's given us some kind of some insight on some things. Now, he has strong opinions, which I, 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 I like people with strong opinions. Even if I disagree with it, uh, personally, I just like that. But yeah. he also gives us a lot of this balanced insight. And mm-hmm. one of the things he had talked about was that communication. And I think even Patty Schockner referenced that last Friday's show that they, they, the GOP leadership, specifically Voss and Fitzgerald, um, really needed to kind of sit down and work this out. And the uh, Republicans say Democrats didn't do this and Democrat or at least Evers administration will say that the GOP leadership didn't do this. So it's just kind of a ugh, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality is it didn't happen. So what grade would you give GOP in this case, specifically the GOP leadership in communicating with Evers' office to get something done? Well, I think I would give them probably something more along the lines of a C. Um, I think that they, it, it takes two to tango. <laughs> yeah. And and you can't have a conversation if the other side's not willing to have a conversation. So there was a certain, I think, level of, um, you know, there was an inability to have a conversation. Um, but I, that that letter grade, in my mind, really, um, I think, is changing because we're now having the conversation. And I think when you see WMC put out a, a proposal about mm. a way that we could try and have a regional county based um, approach to to reopening the economy, um, various senators, there's been a proposal put out by some assembly representatives. I mean, we're having that conversation now, and I think that that means that any kind of initial blunders, um, I think there's time to fix it, and there's time to try and move forward in a way where we find a path forward after we have that conversation. And I think that's good. I celebrate that that progress. I think that that's a good thing that's that's happening. All right. So now let's go back to the issues that are going to be, you know, fast forward a year or two. but. Yeah. We also know that this is going to be those issues in a year or two now. There will be a component of the safer at home order that is going to affect that in the future, even when we're back to that relatively new normal. Mm-hmm. I have three things written down here, three bullet points, because I went to your website and it looked like education, jobs, and healthcare were three mm-hmm. things that you uh, are very passionate about in the 29th Assembly District. So let's start with education. Sure. What are your, uh, how is this going to, uh, Safer at Home, going to impact education going forward? And what are those issues facing the 29th District right now in education? Well, I think that that the Safer at Home order to me is kind of, um, and really the the pandemic generally, is showing um, why it's important to make sure that people have the tools to be able to succeed in their own lives. And... Um, you know, one of the reasons, really kind of the primary reason that I'm running is because I really want to focus on the economic future of small towns, you know, like the town that I grew up in, Milltown, or any of those kinds of smaller communities. I think we need to have a conversation about how these towns move forward. So to your point about education, um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of short-term impacts. My brother's a college student right now, and he's home. He's learning remotely, which is a very different kind of educational yeah. experience, of course. Um, but I think that when you are able to make sure that people have the tools to build successful lives, you are creating resiliency there. And and you're making sure that people have the capacity to, to begin to spring back when when the situation um, settles into whatever the new normal is that we're all heading towards. Mm-hmm. And and so in my mind, when we talk about education or we talk about jobs or we talk about healthcare, those are three issues that help ensure that people can um, support themselves and support their families and then by extension support their communities. And that's how you make sure that a community can make it through not only the good times, but then also the bad ones. And and is that a silver bullet that's going to solve this issue? Well, no. Right. And I don't think that there is one, but it's about making sure that we're building those kinds of base level capacities. Um, And and I don't even think necessarily buildings. I mean, they're there. There are where the 29th district is full of hardworking, smart, committed people. 
And we just have to make sure that that they have the opportunities to get the tools that they need to be successful. So that I think that's the way that it kind of that the that the issues I'm talking about relate to the the challenges that mm-hmm. people are facing. Mm-hmm. But I don't think necessarily that um, the issues I'm talking about exist only in that context either. I mean, they're yeah. these are long term issues that we need to focus. So, and, on. and Rob, <clears throat> excuse me, Rob Staffschult is the current. 29th Assembly District Representative, and he announced mm-hmm. that he was running for the 10th Senate District. Yep. Um, have you had a chance to speak with Rob? And if so, or if not, I guess it doesn't matter. But how do you think he has done as a representative there? Uh, well, I, I, I haven't had a chance to, to talk with Rob. I consider him a, a friend. Um, and I think he's done a really good job representing the people of this district. And I think that he's... Um, uh, you know, demonstrated the kind of leadership that I hope we can continue um, to to carry forward in the 29th district. So mm-hmm. I I'm I, uh, I I celebrate everything that Rob has done and and uh, you know on, onward I guess in, the, in yeah. that perspective. Yeah. <laughs> and how many people? So right now, like I don't even. So the 29th district, of course, is under the three of uh, the 10th Senate district. So mm-hmm. the, what is it? The 28th is Gay Magnifici. This is the 29th. Yep. That's what you're running for. And the thirtieth, that one really don't cover much of because I think it's down even further. Isn't that Zimmerman's? Yep, is that that's Hudson River Falls. Yeah, we don't really cover a lot of that. Uh, how many other people are running? Are there uh, other Republicans? Because you're running as a Republican, uh, obviously. Yep. If you just said that, you know, <laughs> you're like Rob, you must be running as a Republican. Uh, <laughs> r- any other Republicans and any Democrats running? Uh, yeah, there are. There are. Uh, uh, there's a Democrat running. Uh, he ran against Rob previously okay. and then uh there are two other republicans okay race. so you're gonna have a primary in what august yep. 11th or 12th something like that sure. yeah so what would just from the primary standpoint just from your republican um opponents what sets you apart from them well i i think that um my kind of background and and the experience i've had um the experiences i've had i think um i hope i find valuable and i hope that voters will find that valuable mm-hmm. as well um, I really approach the issues I'm talking about, as I kind of mentioned before, from the perspective of um, making sure people have the tools to be successful. And I want to see a 29th Assembly District and a state filled with financially independent, self-supporting, familial people. And those, um, you know, with that kind of goal in mind, that's why these issues are so interesting to me and so important to me. Um, and it a lot of that stems, I think, from my background. My mom's a teacher, and she's a teacher up at Unity uh, mm-hmm. in Balsam Lake. And, you know, I think I, I just, I approach the kind of the challenge of finding and, and helping create financially independent familial people as a challenge, mm-hmm. not of will, because I think everyone wants to be that, mm-hmm. but as a challenge, as I said, of tools. And if we give people tools, I think they're best positioned to build for themselves and their families and, you know, an independent and happy life. And I, I think that would be a really, uh, uh, you know, that would be a goal to work towards that I would be proud of proud of working on. All right. So I'm going to we're gonna start a new segment now. I just thought of it just okay. literally in the last two seconds. I'm putting my talking Ooh. points away. And it's Exciting. just And it's just going to be you and I talk. No, nope, mm-hmm. nobody else. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> um, Excellent. Right. So it's just gonna be like you and I have a phone conversation. So, what do we want to ask? Um, uh, you seem to be a younger person. I don't know what that would be called. A punk kid, I guess. Something. Right. Oh, uh, there okay. you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, is this helping or hurting? Do you think your age? My age in the race. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly hope it's helping. I think it is. Um, I think that, um, you know, being a young person, I think that, you know, youth is no guarantee of innovation. I, I won't hold that just because I'm young, I, I have, have all, all the answers. answers. Right. Yeah. No. I, um, but for the record, just because you're old doesn't mean you have all the answers. <laughs> well, that's a good point. You know, that's not, that's not the way that this works. Right. Right. Um, and I think that I, I hope that I'm talking about issues in a way that is maybe new. And then I'm talking about issues in a way that I hope will kind of get people to start thinking mm. about it's not we need to, I think, to stop thinking as as much about the short term. And I think we need to start kind of trying to broaden the way that we think about the challenges that we face. Mm-hmm. 
And the issues that I'm talking about in this campaign, when we talk about education or jobs or health care, those are not short term issues. And I want a campaign that talks about big ideas. And I want a campaign that talks about how we move small towns forward. Because to me, if we're having a conversation about that, then we're having a conversation about the issues that will make sure that these communities that I love, I mean, my places like my hometown, that's how we know that we're talking about the issues that will yeah. make sure that those towns are around. Because I'll be honest, I'm anxious about the future of small towns. I'm, I'm worried about their capacity to succeed going forward. And we need to make sure that we're talking about that. And I think that if we're not talking about that, I think we're missing the mark. I like the what you had said about big ideas. Um, I, I can't tell you how much I love the idea of big ideas. Uh, I've yeah. recently spoken with some people on city councils and uh, board supervisors in, in uh, a few counties that are on their boards. And they have mentioned to me that they feel like they're just – they're just going in and just going through the motions. All right, call yeah. this meeting to order, do that. But it's like we're not really setting ourselves apart. We're not being proactive. We're not being aggressive. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that time that gets shot down, at least from what I was told, um, is because people are scared of those ideas. Uh, change, yeah. I get, you know, that's that's a tough thing for a lot of people. And it doesn't mean we're yeah. going to change it, but we should have a discussion about let's like, come back to the table with three big ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. The JFK thing, going to the you know moon by the end of the century. I mean, just have yeah. a big idea. It doesn't mean it's the right one or we're going to, but I think sometimes a lot of uh, politicians get bogged down in just an election and just keeping their jobs, which that's perfectly fine. I mean, who would want to keep their job? Uh, but yeah. let's come up with some big ideas. And you think that you're going to be able to bring some big ideas? I hope so. And, and let me kind of talk about um, one of them, and this is an idea that that's kind of percolated around in my head, and it is, I won't claim originality for it, you know, mm. it's not necessarily my own, but when we talk about education, um, and I'll kind of loop this into my experience going through high school and things, so when I went to high school, I dual enrolled, and I took university courses at UW-Stout while I was going to Unity, and that was tremendously helpful for me, and dual enrollment's not necessarily a new thing. But I think that when we are talking about, rather than four-year school, when we're talking about technical college, we're talking about technical education, here's an idea that isn't necessarily new, as I said, but I think one that we should really consider. Is there a way that we could make sure that students in K-12 schools can graduate from high school with a technical associate's degree? And if we're not talking about that issue, not, not part of a degree, but an actual degree, that, to me, would be a radical kind of change in the way that we think about K-12 education, right? Because right now, K-12 education is kind of a, um, a somewhat college prep, and we're working, I think, better to make it less college prep. But we do. We, we emphasize really heavily four-year college, and that's not necessarily the right course for everybody. So are there ways um, – I think the, the – the less big idea version of that, right, is working to integrate more closely K-12 and technical college education. But as far as I'm concerned, they're in high school. There are a bunch of students in high school. And if they're going to go and get a technical degree, why can't we work hard to make sure that they can get most, if not all of it, at their school? Well, now, there are, of course, challenges to that because it's going to cost money and it's going to really require a different way of thinking about K-12 education, but we should have that conversation. And if we're not having that conversation, we should have a conversation about how we work to merge those two systems closer together. Love it. Love it. So uh, you, um, so far, I haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> and, and thankfully, is there is, um, I don't know your other two opponents, I should say that. I, I don't know who they are. So I don't know if they've, they've had experience or, or, or have been uh, in the legislature or anything like that before. But I remember when the, just a couple months ago, Tom Tiffany and Brian Church, when I got to know both of them, both just, you know, outstanding individuals. So this is not a, a rip or a favoritism on either side, just, uh, just the facts. Mm -hmm. That Brian Church came out and one of his angles, because I think that's important in a campaign, or at least that's what I we see. Is there's a Or Jason Church, you're right, thank you. Um, had said that I'm not a career politician. Well, that just tells me that, okay, that's you just haven't done this before, which is fine. 
Mm -hmm. And on top, Tiffany's, I'm an experienced leader, which means that I have been in office for a while. What are your views on the, you know, career politician thing versus, so is it better if you're uh, not a career politician, but you've done the job for 10 years versus I've never done it? Do you think there's an advantage of one over the other? Um, I think that there are, this is, this is kind of a political answer, but I, I think that there are advantages to both. Okay. That's, uh, but, that's legit. As and, long as you can back it up I mean with that, legitimate. Uh, okay. Go ahead. I mean that very, very sincerely. Okay. Um, I think that as in any, um, aspect of life experience is very helpful. And I don't think that um, I, I, I understand fully the impulse to say that people who've been in politics for a long time have potentially lost um, their way. And some of them have. Um, but at the same time, I think that whenever we're considering hiring someone for a position uh, or or putting someone in a job, you look to find someone who um, knows what they're doing. And and I think that um, that's not to say that someone who's new to politics doesn't know what they're doing. And it's not to say that someone who's been in politics for a long time knows what they're doing. But I think that what everyone really wants, like the root of that debate sits on a question of who will be effective for me. And I think that obviously, of course, that's up for voters to decide. But I think in some cases, new voices in an outsider opinion will be more effective for people. And then I think in other cases, sometimes that experience is really important. And I don't think that you can, um, I, I would be hesitant to come down on one side or another in that conversation, because I don't mm -hmm. think that you can discount the importance of having yeah. someone who who's had experience, but at the same time, it's important to make sure you've got fresh ideas too. You know, it. it I agree. It takes a village. I agree because you it, can't it, have all of one of the other. You can't because I think sometimes we see when somebody. What's the saying about uh, what are the three goals of every politician? Get reelected. Get reelected. Get reelected. Where they have these big ideas, maybe when they're running the first time, because why not? Uh, I'm not. Sure. I'm just saying that that that's usually when you'll see some bigger or other ideas, and then they get in and either a they want to maybe just keep their gig, which again can't fault anyone for that to, to you know mm -hmm. keep an income that's yeah. perfectly fine um but maybe that there's a little cynicism or it's well i don't want to screw up a re-election but i think there could be another component of now that i've done this for a while i realize okay it doesn't work that way so we can't necessarily do it in a certain way and i think that's a always a big shocker for when somebody runs as a challenger gets the job and then like in six months later go yeah, I really can't do any of those things I said I was going to do because now I realize there's a lot of there's a lot of moving pieces to this. But I think yeah. what everyone would love to see still are people in office still with those big ideas. Going back to what you yep. said before, that should never ever stop. Like like a, a significant amount of the democratic platform, I'm all for. Question usually is how do we pay for it? But I love the big ideas and let's have those conversations. Otherwise, it's just going to be a a static and that's never good because what is uh if you ever seen the movie tommy boy uh in brake pads you're either growing or you're dying there ain't no third direction i think that's kind of the same thing for any yep. in, in any district it, it, you're either growing or you're dying or any city council or uh, local board y man you got to keep going you, you just can't be going well, through the motions and i think that we need to encourage and celebrate in political leaders an apparent um capacity for learning and and I, I don't think that we should regard um, always, uh, uh, you know, finding a new position um, as as being a sellout. If you learn something that changes the way that you think about an issue, then as far as I'm concerned, you're doing your job. I know it. And and <laughs> that is OK. Yeah. And again, if you can explain why. And and especially, I think if you if you've changed a position on something, if you can explain why, and you can and you can articulate why maybe what you thought previously was wrong, then then it's up to you yeah. to make sure you've got yeah. a good explanation. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> own it. Do, That's it. Good. Just own it. It's okay. You I know, changed my mind this that, last weekend about three different things. <laughs> it's, it, we all do it do? all the time. I know. Yeah. <laughs> what can you do? Where can people but go? I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, well, I was just going to put in another plug, I think, for big ideas, because I think that, you know, when when we look at the world that we're in, 
um, and everything that is changing, not only the pandemic, but even before then, we're we're in a in a new um, time in the country and in in the state. And I think we need ideas to match that new do- new time. And I think that we need people who can go into government and begin articulating um, a way forward. And as a Republican, I think that we need Republicans who can go into government and who can articulate a way forward that reflects core values of independence and self-sufficiency um, in a new and changing world. And I am excited about the race to to talk about issues in that way, because I think that that um, to me, you know, if I can spend my time talking about these issues, even if I lose, I will be proud of the campaign. I will be proud of what I and and the people around me have helped um, to do. And I think that that would that would be something to feel good about. Uh, It was about maybe a year ago that I came to that same conclusion. Now, you're uh, a lot younger than I. Hmm. Actually, we're pretty much the same age, so whatever. Uh, uh, I think so. Yeah. Uh, but it was, uh, when I started driving, it was, you know, listening to these people, and, oh, well, you're, you're, you're leaning too far to the right or left. I'm like, well, I don't think I am, but you're, I was constantly trying to please other people. And, mm-hmm. and then it just kind of hit me that, you know, I, I just need to do what I think is right and for the right reasons, and if you agree with it, fine. If not, that's perfectly fine, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it doesn't mean we stop doing anything that we're doing. But I just want to yeah. know that whether it, Dryden Wine is successful, or in your case, whether you get elected or not, I am who I am, and you're going to know who I am and what I think and what I feel, and 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 leave it at that. Because I hate the yeah. cliche, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's it's still just you. It's your last name, and it's your integrity, and it's your character, and your ethics, and absolutely, and, and that's really it, man. In my yeah. opinion, where can people I, go and find out more information about you? Uh, well, you can head over to the campaign Facebook page. Um, that's one place. What? Neil Klein for State Assembly. Okay. Um, or you can head to the website, neilkleinforassembly.com. There's information there as well. Okay, perfect. So, Anything else you want to touch on? I, I want to point out one thing, um, and I think it's kind of a good, a good kind of uh, way to sum up, I think, what you just said. And, and I agree with it fully. There are two thoughts. One, um, it is my goal at the end of every day to be able to put my head down on my pillow and sleep peacefully, knowing that I have done my best. Amen. And that... I've done my best to do good. And two, in politics specifically, um, I am someone who believes that you always must be comfortable losing. And if you lose because you did the right thing, then that is a price that you have to be willing to accept. Now, let me be clear. I want to win, and I'm here to win, (laughs) and I'm playing to win. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to win at the expense of doing what I think is right, because that's not a way to be. I love it, man. I absolutely love it. Thanks so much for being on. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. I had a really great time, yeah. and uh, the time flew. I can't believe it. Yeah, I think we're, I don't know, like 40 minutes or something. So, But now, because the first time someone's on, you know, it's a little more uh, politics stuff, or especially as a candidate, getting to know you and, and our you know, mm-hmm. dynamic. and uh, But usually the second show is a lot more fun. Not that this one wasn't. So, point is, you should come back on when we get a little closer to the election. I would love to come back on. I think that would be great. Awesome. I appreciate your time so much, man. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Special thank you to my guest today, Wisconsin's 29th Assembly District candidate, Neil Klein. And thank all of you for watching. Remember, don't miss tomorrow morning's Dryden Wire Live show when Chris Fitzgerald and I will be raising money for a nonprofit, Embrace, and giving away a free sponsorship for a future show and another small business uh, for the choice of a winner in tomorrow's drawing. More information can be found on our website, drydenware.com. So until then, stay safe, keep your social distance, and have a blessed day.